Um, and we're going to go through go to Psalm chapter two today because they, they work together. And so I'm going to take a couple of weeks to go through a couple of Psalms. But today, if you've got a Bible, why don't you turn me to Psalm, Psalm two, second Psalm. These two Psalms, they go together as an introduction, introduction into the whole entirety of what's called the Psalter. The Psalter is just the book of Psalms, all 150 Psalms. And so Psalms are divided into five different books within the book of Psalms. But Psalm 1 and Psalm 2 serve as an introduction to them. You cannot understand the entirety of the Psalms unless you first understand the first two introductory Psalms, Psalm 1 and Psalm 2. They, they were once at one point in time, they were read together as a collective, but they're they're now separated into two psalms, but they still work together. Last week, we, we talked about what it means to be truly blessed and, and, and the blessed life of the person and the, the individual like the, that God has this ideal person. Like there's an ideal person that we're supposed to be. Right. The problem with the ideal person is that, that, that the ideal person is is sinless. And so in the text, we realize that we fall short of who the ideal person is, which will fall short of living the blessed life. However, there is an ideal person who fulfill all of God's requirements in Psalm chapter one. And because of his righteousness and because of his way of following God and his delighting in the Lord, we also get to be the blessed life because we're connected to that ideal person. And so what Psalm two is going to do is Psalm two is going to bring that ideal person into full view so we can actually who he is, what he has done and what he is doing. And so I think today, not intentionally, but providentially, this will speak directly to where we are as a people, where we are as a country. And, and I think that God will say some stuff to us today to get our eyes focused back on him. So if you got a Bible, Psalm, chapter, Psalm 2, verses 1 through 12. And it says this. Why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth take their stand and the rulers conspire together against the Lord and his anointed one. Here's what they say. Let, let's tear off their chains and throw their ropes off of us. And then God responds. And God says, the one enthroned in heaven, he, he laughs. The Lord ridicules them. He speaks, then he speaks to them in his anger and terrifies them in his wrath. He says this, I have installed my king on Zion, my holy mountain. Then that king says, wait a minute, I can speak for myself. And here's what he says. He says, I will declare the Lord's decree. He said to me, you are my son. Today I have become your father. Here's what the Lord told the son, ask of me. And I will make the nations your inheritance and the ends of the earth your possession. You will break them with an iron scepter. You will shatter them like pottery. And then either the son or God extends an invitation to the rulers of the earth. He says, so now, kings, be wise. Receive instruction, you judges of the earth. Serve the Lord with reverential awe and rejoice with trembling. Pay homage to the son or he will be angry and you will perish in your rebellion for his anger may ignite at any moment. But the good news is this. There's always good news. All who take refuge in him are happy. All who take refuge in him are happy. Let us. Father, we thank you, God, today that we can come and study your word, God, that we can receive from you that we can worship through the preaching of God's word God our prayer today is that you would visit with us God we, we invite you in today God to speak to your people God God speak to us speak your word God change our lives work on our hearts God renew our minds God C convict us where we need convicting and encourage us where we need courage and so, Father, I just pray today, God, that we tune out all distractions, and that the that silence, God, will be our portion, that we can be silent enough in our hearts and our minds to hear what you have to say to us today. God, don't let us be mere speakers, God, but allow us to participate in the preaching of your word. Let us respond 
to what you have to say. And so, Father, I pray ultimately that you don't hear me, but that I pray that your son Jesus would be glorified today, that Christ, that his name would be made famous today, God, that we would fix our eyes upon Jesus. And so, Father, thank you today. Glory, we give you honor. It is in Jesus' name we pray. And the people of God said, Amen. You may be seated. My sermon title today is God is in control. God is in control. Psalm 2 is what is known as a royal psalm. It's known as a royal song because it addresses kingship for the people of God. It, it addresses kingship for the people of God, what they should look for and who they should look for as a leader of God's people. This psalm, this song brings this king into light and shows us who he is and what he does and how he serves his people. Psalm 2 is not just a royal psalm, it's also a prophetic psalm. It is a prophetic psalm because it gives hope or it gave hope to a nation of Israelites who had gone through exile, who had experienced fell leadership after fell leadership after fell leadership. And this royal psalm gave them hope to keep their eyes forward and to look forward in spite of their present circumstances. They, they were sent into Babylonian exile and so everything that they knew was now different. They were in a place that they did not want to be or they were coming out of something that they didn't want to be and they were in a bad place for an extended period of time. And so we, we look at this and we look in their particular context for the people of God at that time, they probably were asking this fundamental question, where is God in all of this that is going on today? Where is God in the midst of all of the chaos and confusion? Where is God in the midst of everything that seems to keep going wrong? Where is God in the midst of all of this disorder that we are experiencing in the world today? Where is God in all of this? How could God sit back and allow people to suffer and do nothing about it? How can God allow people to stand for unrighteousness and stand for it boldly? How can God just sit back and let the wicked prosper and allow his righteous to suffer. Where is God in all of this? And the answer that Psalm 2 brings into light for us is that God is not hiding. God is not in a panic room somewhere. God is not hiding behind a desk. God is not holed up in a room somewhere. God is not frantic, franticking. God is not fretting. God is not waiting for someone to graciously give at the table, God is not on hold waiting to take his rightful place, but God is right where he's always been seated on the throne in control. This is what this brings to light for us, that, that God is not out of touch with what is happening. And so the psalm inquires or encourages the people of God to, to see this righteous king and know that security and hope for their future if they put their trust in him. And so what this song will do for them and what it did for us, what it does for us practically is it allows us to interpret world events through the eyes of God. If we understand Psalm 2, we have a right perspective on how to see the events that are happening in our world. If you want to know how to see the changes and the upheaval that is going on in our world, this psalm would allow us to interpret these things through the eyes of God. And here's what this psalm is assuring the people of God of, that God is not detached, that God is not removed, but God is actively engaged and, in, and, and, and involved in working on behalf of his people, even when it looks like he's not. And so Psalm 1 and 2 go together. Psalm 1 gave the perspective of God's sovereignty in the lives of individuals. The, the last blessing in Psalm 1 was that God watches over the way of the righteous. God watches over the way of the righteous. That if you are in God and your righteousness is in him, he is watching over your way. Nothing about your life is out of, outside of the scope of God. God knows everything that is going on in your life. Even the difficult stuff that you're trying to deal with and grappling with, God is in control. God is watching over your way. Even if you're in 
about your future, God is watching over the way of the righteous. If you are concerned about your finances, God is watching over the way of the righteous. If you're worried about your family, God is watching over the way of the righteous. But here, Psalm 2 gives us the perspective and understanding that God rules not just over individuals, but God also is sovereign over the affairs of nations. Daniel chapter 2 verse 21 tells us this. He says that he changes the times and seasons. He removes kings and he establishes kings. God does that. God does that. I, I want to offend you for a second. Please allow me to offend you. We vote, but God determines. We vote, but God determines. God is not sitting back on pins and needles, praying for a candidate and lobbying for recounts and calling for voter fraud and lashing out in hopeless despair because a candidate didn't win. God didn't cast a vote. God made a decision. God made a decision. And the main point that I want to get you to understand today is that God is sovereign. God reigns. God is in control of all things. But if we have a hard time trusting that God is sovereign over the nations and affairs of the world, we will have a hard time believing he's sovereign over our lives. If he's not sovereign over the nations then truly he can't be sovereign over our lives. But some of us, our theology is so small that we think God is only sovereign as it relates to our personal experiences. But your theology has to get big enough to know that God ain't just in control of your life. God is in control of all things. He, he, he is the God of creation. He is the God of creation. And what this psalm is allowing us to do, he's inviting us to open our eyes and hearts Celebrate that God is the king of kings and the Lord of lords. That, that for them, this was an opportunity to trust, to trust God, that, that God was sending them a king. And God has already sent a king that has come to rule righteously, fairly and justly. This this king will live up to what every other leader in every other king could not lead up to. Leave up, live up to. This psalm celebrates for them the future reality that there at some point will be a world without chaos, that, that at some point there will be a world without evildoers. And so for the church, we look forward to the day of our redemption and to an era of peace and victory for God's people, a day when we will be free of all of our enemies. And so it's for us an invitation to trust God and see the power of God on display, that if we understand Psalm 2 rightly, we can pray with confidence, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We, we know that, that, that at our Lord's return, peace will rule over the hearts of all people and that, that, the, that the nations that are raging against God, all of the raging will cease at some point. And so you need to know this, that he will come and conquer all of the enemies of the people of God. Nothing will be able to stop the plan of God. Nothing can stop the plan of God. But that won't stop people from trying. That will stop them from trying. So, so here's what's happening in Psalm 2. It's going to take us through four different acts. Psalm 2 takes us through four different acts. It's like a, a cinematic thriller. It's like a, a, a movie. It's, it's four different acts and sequences that we see. In verses 1 through 3, the nations are responding to God's rule. The nations are responding to God's rule. Then in the second act, God comes on the scene and God has a comedic response to the nations. They, they respond to God, but, but God laughs at them. And, and then in the third scene, another person comes on the scene. God, God's son comes and he speaks for himself. And then finally, both God and the son, because they are one, they extend an invitation to the nations to stop tripping and to start worshiping. And, and so you see four acts, verses one through three is one act. Verses four through six is another act. Verses seven through nine is an act. And verses 10 through 12 is another sequence. And so we see God and him and this this king, this kingship. Do you know, back back in those days, it was not uncommon that when a new king came and got on the throne, that the smaller state or other people would try to have an upheaval and overthrow the newly installed king, that that the people would get upset and they would try to break free from the rule of, of the new king. And so the, the, the smaller nations would, would plot and, and conspire against 
the king that is in place. And so if you look at verses one through three, here's the first thing that we see. It says, it says, why do the nations rage and the people's plot in vain? Why do the nations rage and the people's plot in vain? The kings of the earth, they take their stand and the rulers conspire together against the Lord and his anointed one. And here's what they say. Let's tear off their chains and throw off their, throw their ropes off of us. And so what we see here is an international conspiracy taking place. That the nations have come together to figure out how they can get rid of God. And so when it says that the nations rage, it, really, it, it literally means that the nations are restless. Like they are, they're restless. They are having a remot an emotional response to God's kingship. They, they are having an emotional response because they're, they're not feeling it. And, and so it says that they are plotting. What's interesting about the word plotting there, the word plotting is the same word that is translated meditate in Psalm chapter one. If we remember Psalm chapter one, it says uh, uh, the one delights himself in the law of God or in God's instructions. And he does what? He meditates on it day and night. He, he meditates on it day and night. He's he's meditating on God's words. He's murmuring, murmuring about it under his breath. He's meditating and repeating God's word. Right. And it says that the nations are raging and, and, and they're plotting in vain. They're plotting. If it, if it means the same thing as it means to meditate in Psalm one, what they're doing is as opposed to meditating on God's word, they're murmuring amongst themselves on how they can overthrow God. They're having planning meetings on how they can get rid of God. And so. If the godly meditate on God's word day and night, the ungodly conspire against God. And, and, and the crazy thing is that these nations that are referenced, they don't necessarily have a reason to work together. They don't necessarily get along with each other. The commonality is that they both reject God at the same time. And, and so the connection point for the people is that we don't like God. It, it's crazy how we can have different perspectives on something, but if we got a common enemy, we can rock together. And, and, and so the nations have come together, even though they have nothing to do with each other. They don't necessarily like each other, but they have a common enemy and the common enemy is God. But they're not just conspiring against God. They're conspiring against God. And the text tells us his anointed one, his anointed one. The word anointed. We, if you grew up in church, you've heard the word anointed before. Some people are anointed. Man, that guy's anointed to sing. <laughs> He's anointed to preach. Right. We know the word anointed. The word anointed means Messiah in Hebrew. It means Messiah in Hebrew. It is a, actually a title. It, anointed, it means Messiah, which is actually a title. It, it is a title, a title that is only befitting of one king. Th this anointed one is not like any of the Israelite kings. And no, he's not like David. No, he's not like Solomon. He's not like them in any way, shape or form. This this anointed title only fits one person. And so to call somebody else under other kings anointed is like putting uh, uh, NFL shoulder pads on a little boy. It just don't fit. It, it, it just don't fit. And, and so if we translate the word anointed in Greek, the word anointed means Christ. You did know that Christ is not Jesus' last name, right? That Jesus the Christ is a title. He's God's anointed one. It's not his last name. And so here's what he's saying. They conspire against the Lord and his anointed one. You cannot be for God and be against Jesus at the same time. They can't be separated we can't say in God we trust, but we hate Jesus. That, that, that's not how that works. That they, they are one and the same. First John chapter two tells us no one who denies the son has the father. If you don't have Jesus, you don't have God because they're one in the same. And so when the New Testament writers uh, were, were facing opposition and they were uh, trying to spread the gospel and they were facing all types of suffering and persecution, you know what they referred back to? Acts chapter 4, verses 25 to 29 tells us what they refer back to. Here's how they saw their suffering. They look back, and I want to see if these words sound familiar to you today. Verse 25, you said through the Holy Spirit by the mouth of our father David, your sermon, your servant, why do the Gentiles rage and the people plot futile things? The kings of the earth take their stand and the rulers assemble together against the Lord and against his Messiah. For in fact, they put it in their terms, in this city, both Herod and Pontius Pilate 
with the Gentiles and with the people of Israel assembled together against your holy servant, Jesus, whom you anointed to do whatever your hand and your will had predestined to take place. And now, Lord, consider their threats and grant your servants that they may speak your word with all boldness. And what they are seeing here, the, the, the first church is looking back to Psalm 2. And they are interpreting their suffering through the scriptures in the Old Testament. And they realize that if the nations were plotting against God back then, the nations are still plotting against God now. And so the king now comes into clear picture and clear view. And the people of God are trying to push God's agenda. They're trying to live on mission, but they keep getting opposition. But no matter what happens, the people can't stop the plan of God. I want to tell you this today. This is now the time for the church actually to do what the church is supposed to do. We work best against opposition. But we've been accustomed to think that God can only work when we're on easy street. But how can God get glory off of easy street? We grow and our faith expands and the kingdom expands through suffering. We show off the glory of Christ when we can still be who God called us to be in spite of the opposition that we face. And so this is how they interpreted their suffering. They knew that God was sovereign even over the opposition that they faced to do what God called them to do. They saw the sovereign hand of God even in the suffering and the death of God's son. The, the mission of God has always responded and moved the best against opposition. And here's what you need to know, practically speaking. Nothing can stop the plan and the mission of God and God's people, no matter what we face. But I got to go back to the verse one. I got to go back to verse one because verse one does something interesting. It doesn't just tell us something. It asks us a question. Look at verse one. The psalmist asks a question. Why? 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 Why, why, why do the nations rage and the people's plot in vain? He's literally asking, the, why do they even think that they can succeed against God? What makes them think that this will work? What makes anybody think that they can go against God? How can anyone have the audacity and the unmitigated God to go against God? Whoever said, you know what, I'm going to go against God and it's going to work out for me. Like, like who, who would ever do this? And he's asking this question because he's astonished and he's appalled at the same time that the nations would attempt to overthrow God. And what he's saying is their attempts are futile and they are vain. Who can get rid of God? The same God who said the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. How are you going to kick him out of his own house? How can you get rid of God? And so, so I'm, he's asking, why, why do they even do this? I'll tell you why they do this. It's a simple answer to the question of why the nation's rage and the people's plight in vain. They want their freedom. They want to be free. They saw the way of God as slavery and bondage to them being who they actually wanted to be. God is stopping us from becoming who we want to be. That they saw God's way as weighing them down and holding them back from experiencing true freedom and true happiness. It's, it's as if they think that they can escape him and get rid of God's presence all at the same time. They, they, they don't just reject God. They, they reject God arrogantly. It says that they throw the chains off. They, they tear off God's rope. And so what, is, what does it look like for us in our day? It looks like this. We're evolving as people. We're just evolving. The Bible is antiquated. I mean, we could, why are we still sticking to these old rules? I don't believe some of that stuff in the Bible. I don't, I don't believe some of that stuff in the Bible. Don't you think if God was here today, he'd change some of this stuff? I, I don't, really? Can't people just love who they want to love? I mean, what different? Doesn't everybody deserve a choice to do what they want to do? I mean, come on, the, the Bible, really? I mean, it's got some good stuff in there. It's some high, some high stuff in there. Like, you know, it's some good stuff in there. I, I, like, I like the little forgiveness piece, the little love thing. I like that. Like, God is love. I like, that's just good stuff. Like, I like that. That's a little smart. That's a good piece. But this is what it looks like for people to try to tear God's chains off and do what they want to do. This is what the nations do. Can you see the ridiculousness of the nations to try to get rid of God? But I wouldn't be too comforted if I was you. Because oftentimes we're just like the nations. 
We're just like them in our relationship with God. Oftentimes we want to break free from God's reign over our lives. So sometimes we just want to do what we want to do. And the only thing getting in our way is this God thing. Well, we, we buy into the world's way of placing self and satisfaction of me, just like the nations. We, we put our own stuff over God's. We, we choose independence over God dependence. We, we, we want to be free from God. And so our society and culture, it, it makes us think that true happiness comes through our personal freedom. That, 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 that we all at times try to move God out of the way and go after our own security and satisfaction. And that is our rebellion that is rooted in our sin nature. But, nature. but for us as believers in our flesh, we daily face temptations of taking the reins off and pursuing our own rendition of freedom. But God, by his grace, grants us daily forgiveness to come Come boldly to the throne of grace to obtain mercy in his time of need. And let me tell you this, God's grace is not just about forgiving your sin, but God's grace also empowers you to make the right decisions in the face of temptation. And so we have to lean on God's grace, but it is a constant struggle not to get engulfed in the plans and the plots of the kings and nations that daily attempt to move God out of the picture. But God knows our plight and God understands this reality. There is one that has demonstrated what it looks like for all people to be absolutely loyal to God. That same one has empowered and is empowering his people to delight themselves in God. And that is the person of Jesus. And we must follow him. So the nations are plotting and they're raging in vain and God has a response in verses four through six look at God's comedic response to the nations verse four says the one enthroned in heaven laughs he's like for real <laughs> he's laughing like Denzel Washington after Hoyt got bold in training day and shot Denzel <laughs> shoe program He's laughing like he's laughing like Denzel in training day. And when it says that God is laughing, what it's trying to convey to us is God is unbothered. God, God is unbothered by society's attempts to move him out of the way. He doesn't even see these people as real threats to what he's trying to get accomplished. For, for, for the nations to think that they can remove God and be independent to, of them. But God says that this is laughable. That is a false premise to think that you can rule something independent of God. And so the nations are restless and they are raging and they are plotting and God is laughing from heaven. But it's not just a comedic laugh like something's funny. He's laughing because of the ridiculousness, the ridiculousness of it. And it's not funny at all. It's a laugh of derision. He's mocking them. He's insulting them with his laugh. It, it's, he's laughing because it's not really funny. His laughter is actually his judgment. You ever been so mad at somebody? And it was so ridiculous that you was laughing, but you was laughing because you was one second away from busting them in the face. <laughs> boy, boy, I'm telling you, boy, you try me one more time, boy, I'm telling you. You ever did that, somebody? This is what God is doing. It's a laugh of derision. And God is essentially saying to them, you tried it. And this is what he says to us. That when we try to make plans apart from him, when we intentionally leave God out or we try to convince ourselves that I'm good with God, although I'm making a conscious decision, to move forward in that which I know God is not in. God laughs. God doesn't panic. God doesn't go in a back room like a crazy uncle that's not on his medication and sits back. God, God literally laughs at those who conspire against him. God laughs because it is foolish and futile to go against him. God is not moved by society and culture's attempts to move him out of the way or erase him from the earth. God is unmoved and as his children, we should be unmoved too. And so when we see the world going crazy and haywire, we shouldn't panic. Why are we panicking like everybody else? Yes, we get involved. I hear you. Yes, we look at the news too. Yes, we peruse social media. Yes, we get discouraged and disillusioned with politicians. But at the end of the day, we have to reorient our eyes and hearts back to God because our hope is ultimately in him alone. Our hope is in God alone. God has already installed the leader of all leaders, the authority above all other authorities. God ain't waiting for a recount. It's already been settled in heaven. God is not waiting to react to us. God has already done what God is going to do. God is not surprised by 
anything. God is like, I already installed my king. I already put him on the throne from Zion. I from heaven installed my own king. And now the king comes on the scene and he's like, I'm gonna let my son speak for himself. And here's what the son says in verses seven through nine. Here's what he says. He says, I will declare the Lord's decree. I'm gonna just say what he said. Here's what he said to me. Here's what my daddy said to me. You are my son. Today I have become your father. Ask of me and I'll make the nations your inheritance in the ends of the earth your possession. You will break them with an iron scepter. You will shatter them like pottery. I want you to see this relationship. That God's relationship with the king is like a son and a father. It's an intimate relationship. And just like if it was a family business, the son represents the interests of the father. The son just follows the instructions of his dad. He is submitted to the will of God. And God made a promise to David. He made a promise to David that, hey, David, at some point, you will have someone who will rule in your lineage. David had just came back from war. He knocked off the Philistines real quick, got the Ark of the Covenant, brought it back to Jerusalem. He was like, man, I'm balling out of control. I'm balling out of control. My house is crazy. But God is living in a tent. I got <laughs> I to get God a house. I got to get God somewhere nicer to live. God, you got to do better than this. And God's like, I don't want you to build me a house. I'm going to build you a house. Ain't that crazy how you say you'll try to do something for God and God one-ups you like you can't do better than me? God, I'm going to do this for you. God's like, no, nah, I'm going to blow your mind with this. And this is what happens. And instead of allowing David to build him a house, he says, David, I'm going to build you a royal house. I'm going to make sure that you sit on the throne forever, that somebody in your lineage will sit on the throne forever. I will always be with you. It's called the Davidic covenant. And here's what it says in the Davidic covenant. He says this, I will be his father, this son, I'll be his father, and he will be my son. I will be his father, he will be my son. And so this son will be the representative of all the people. He would do what no earthly king could ever do, and he would do what no earthly king has ever done. This son would be obedient to God, and his obedience would be our obedience. His resurrection would be our resurrection. His righteousness would be our righteousness. And so if we recall these words of the psalmist, we've seen them before in the New Testament when he says, today you become my son, I'm your father. We've seen this before when Jesus comes on the scene and at the beginning of Jesus's ministry, we find Jesus being baptized by John. And what happens with the voice from heaven? He says, this is my beloved son with whom I'm well pleased. And we see the fulfillment take place in the New Testament, and Jesus is the son. Jesus' baptism is the anointing where the father says, you are the one that I have chosen. You are my son. I'll fill you with the Holy Spirit to get my job and get my work done. And so Paul says, even a step further, that when Jesus was resurrected from the grave, that was further proof that he was who he said he was. So we have Jesus being king of kings and Lord of lords. That there is no argument of it, that, that, that nobody should be debating who runs the world, that, that, that the question has been answered. All other debates have been settled. There's nothing for us to talk about. Do God, does God exist? Does God not exist? The argument has been settled in heaven. Jesus rules on the throne. I don't care who says it, who tries to disprove it, who argues against it. Jesus is king of kings and Lord of lords. But that has implications for you and I because he is doing what God has called him to do. But because we are connected to Jesus, we reign with Jesus. So if Jesus is reigning, we are reigning as well. That means that we don't have to sit on the sidelines. It means that we can have the confidence to do what God called us to do. That it means that no, no matter what happens, in the world that we put our trust in Jesus. Here's what it says in Psalm, Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6 through 7. Would you look at this? Here's what it says. For a child will be born for us. A son will be given to us. And the government will be on his shoulders. He will be named Wonderful Counselor. Mighty God, eternal father, prince of peace. 
The dominion will be vast and its prosperity will never end. He will reign on the throne of David over his kingdom to establish and sustain with righteous, with justice and righteousness from now on and forever. The zeal of the Lord of armies, armies will accomplish this. What does that mean for me, Pastor? That Jesus gives us leadership. He comes to lead God's people back to God. The number two thing is that he represents the people before God. He is the mediator by which we experience the blessings of God. That because of the Son of God, those who receive the Son of God, he gave them the power to be called sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, because Jesus is a son that makes us sons and daughters. And we reign with him. We are his co-heirs to fulfill the commission that God gave us. Now, when we see what's happening in the world, it should alarm us that this is our opportunity to fulfill the Great Commission. If you've ever been bold about Jesus, now is the time. That this is not a season for us to be apathetic about God. This is not a, for a season for us to worry like everybody else is. Look, I, I get it. We all are emotionally involved at this point, right? We're all invested. But we have to remember who's actually in control. That no matter what happens in this country or any place in the world, God is still reigning in control. I, I, I'll be honest with you. I was a little discouraged earlier this week because I'm seeing Christians evangelical Christians throwing hissy fits because their guy didn't get elected. And I'm like, for a whole bunch of other reasons, I'm disturbed by that, but <laughs> that's besides the point. Way besides the point. But oh, you can preach the gospel as long as your guy's in the office. Oh, but it's going to be this, and the, 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 the policies are going to be this, and it's not going to favor us, and oh my God, we're going to lose our religious liberties. Good! It's coming a time and a point where we're going to have to go underground. Do you think the early church was like, yay, Caesar. He's enacting policies that favor us. They knew it could cost them their lives. And we're tripping over policies. And I'm not saying that we don't want people in office that align with our Judeo-Christian values. I'm not saying that. But to act like the world is over because your guy ain't in office is ridiculous. And it makes me glad that God is tearing down idols. I saw a, I saw a pastor two weeks ago put his whole ministry on the line if this guy didn't get in office. I'm going to ride by there at the church, see if he's still open. If your ministry is based off of your guy getting office, you ain't got a ministry. Don't hear me saying, oh, 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 pro-life, pro-choice. That's not what I'm saying. That's important. But our mission doesn't stop. And this invites us in to put our hope where it really should be in Christ. What happens to the nations? This is bad news. Verse 9 is really bad for them. It literally says this, you will break them with an iron scepter. You will, you will shatter them like pottery. Like, like anybody that comes against his reign and his authority, like he breaks them in half. He shatters them like they are nothing, like they are pottery. He uses a scepter to do it, which was an instrument of divine judgment, an instrument that you use to break something, except for this king didn't use an iron scepter as a weapon. Instead, he embraced the cross as a divine scepter to destroy every enemy, including sin and death. 
but just like God. With bad news, there's always good news. And we find the good news in verses 10 through 12. So now, kings, you've done all you could. You can't get rid of me. I'm not going anywhere. Be wise. Receive instruction. Serve the Lord with reverential awe and rejoice with trembling. Pay homage to the son or he will be angry and you will perish in your rebellion for his anger may ignite at any moment. All who take refuge in him are happy. And what they're saying is snap out of it. Come to your senses. This is a warning, but it's also an invitation. Be perceptive. Be politically shrewd and count the cost before you decide to go against God. What is calling for is submission. That all people, that all nations should submit to God. Choose him. Respond with repentance and trust. That goes for all of us. That there, there are things in our hearts and our lives that have replaced God. We need to repent of it and put our trust back where it needs to be in God. But then we need to serve God. Serve him. Serve him with reverential fear and awe. Rejoice with trembling. Fear of the Lord is actually the beginning of wisdom. And then here's what he wants us to do. He wants us to worship God. And to worship God means this. That I put away my personal freedoms. And I realize that my freedom is actually in God. That I trade in my fleshly freedoms for God's glorious freedoms. And so this is the way, going back to Psalm 1, to avoid the path of destruction. Choose wisely. Choose God. I, I don't know what area of your life will you still roll with the crowd or roll with the tide of culture. But today is the day to go against the grain. What do you need to relinquish? What thing, what person, what, what ideology, what, what perspective stands in the way of you growing in God? We all have to ask ourselves that question. Because it is easy for us in our human nature to erect our own altars of worship and sit them right here on our heart. But God invites us to tear them down, turn away and put our trust in him. All who take refuge in him are happy. The way to happiness is not doing what you want, but doing what God says. I'm just not at peace. I'm just not at peace. Are you in God? I'm just so confused. I'm just I'm just I'm just disillusioned by everything that's going on. Are you in God? Lastly, I'll say this. We can refuse him. Or we can take refuge in him. We can refuse him. Or we can take refuge in him. So when we look out over the world. We're not praying, hoping God would do this or do that. We pray knowing. We pray knowing with confidence that God's plan and God's will will come to pass. That nothing can stand against the plan of God. This is a call for us to put our hope and our trust back in him because God is in control let us pray father we thank you today we 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 honor you today God and and we ask that you would come into our hearts God and work on us that God you will renew our minds today God that we would turn from our apathy, turn from our idols, turn from the distractions and come back and sit at your feet. God, God, let us find 
hope in you. So, Father, corporately, we repent. We ask of your grace. We ask your grace, your mercy would be our portion. That, God, you would forgive us for ignoring you. That you forgive us for being apathetic towards you. That, that you'd forgive us, God, of all the things that we've done to displease you. And Father, we put our hope and our trust in the righteous king, which is Jesus. That we take joy in him. That our confidence is in God. Not in man, but in God. So, Father, we thank you today for working in our lives. We thank you that as a people, we can get in alignment with your will and with your agenda. And we thank you for it now. It's in Jesus' name we pray. And the people of God said, Amen. Would you put your hands together for the word of God this morning? Hey, I pray that you were blessed by the message that you just watched. Hey, the gospel always calls for response. And one of the ways that the gospel calls for us to respond is through our giving. God gave extravagantly to his people by giving his son. And so we give financially, we give not to get something from God, but we give as a response to what God has already given us, which was life through his son. Hey, why don't you consider partnering with us financially by giving to the work of ministry? Hey, we do so much in our community to be a blessing to those around us. We're not here in the business of taking, but we're in the business of giving what's been given to us. And so, hey, why don't you go on our website, outpouringorlando.com, click on the donate tab, and you can give to the work of the ministry that is being done through the outpouring. Hey, once again, I pray that you've been blessed and we look forward to seeing you soon. Take care.